want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. One of Frederick Taylor's descendants, John Taylor Gatto, has rebelled against his forebear's legacy. An award-winning teacher, he has also rebelled against the state of his profession. The key is the word compulsion. The idea of drawing all children, all young people into some universal program administered by the leader or the leaders is as old as Plato, probably older. But nowhere on earth was that able to be imposed until northern Germany under the military rule of the Prussians finally imposed that in 1818, so in the first, second decade of the 19th century. That is the first time it was announced in other places, but never was it able to be successfully administered because the idea is so crazy and so damaging inherently that people simply disobeyed the law. The experience of Prussian Germany was that it was possible to convert sovereign human beings into human resources. That's a translation of a German compound. And that by making these people incomplete, making them unable to think in contexts, but they could be converted into specialist tools for management, scientific management. Horace Mann was hired by the railroad and coal interests of New England to bring about compulsion. He had no interest in schooling. He was an ambitious young politician. He did get compulsion laws passed in 1852. Once it was in Massachusetts, it spread very, very slowly. It wasn't for 15 more years that another state followed suit. So it hardly was a gift of, to the populous portion of America. I smile a little bit when I say that because the mythology is that it was greeted everywhere with great enthusiasm. Not only did parents resist compulsory schooling, they sometimes did so violently. So vehement was the opposition in Barnstable on Cape Cod that state militia were brought in to march children to school under armed guard. A primary reason why the mass of the American population resisted compulsory schooling was a widespread belief that its purpose had little to do with education and everything to do with control. Their suspicions were well-founded. An undercurrent of class warfare runs through early American education documents. The U.S. Bureau of Education Circular of Information for April 1872 explains that inculcating knowledge teaches workers to be able to perceive and calculate their grievances, thus making them more redoubtable foes in labor struggles. Such an enabling is bound to retard the growth of industry. Sixteen years later in the report of the Senate Committee on Education is equally explicit. We believe that education is one of the principal causes of discontent of late years manifesting itself among the laboring classes. The first Red Scare, in my judgment, is the trigger event for the embedment of compulsion schooling in the United States. The uh, Red Scare of 1848 is probably the reason that one American state fell under the compulsion regimen. There are literally thousands of books from the period 1880 to, say, 1920, roughly, 
that deal with how you scientifically engineer a factory or a church congregation or young people in school. School which followed a general outline of converting kids into obedient tools now took on a very, very mechanistic aspect under this surge of scientific engineering. In 1903, the Atlantic Monthly called for adoption of scientific management in schools. Prominent education theorist William C. Bagley stressed a need for unquestioned obedience. The new system would train children for life in 20th century America. Their role to fulfill the needs of commerce, industry, and government. In the community with the best education, more shoppers, more merchandise moving, a higher average of per capita sales. In the other community, fewer shoppers. Maybe things will look up in the long run. In the first community, there's a larger magazine circulation per 1,000 population. A much smaller circulation in the second community, a decline in demand. The student of typing, shorthand, and business machines becomes a producer upon graduation, a tax-developed community asset. He prepares for radio and electronics. His future promises a profit on the taxes invested in him. As education raises the cultural level, so it must also introduce youth to the know-how of production and stir interest in precision, efficiency, and service. With graduation, the community receives a new supply of young people who want a better life on the one hand and who have the ability to work for it on the other. Now the tax investment returns to the taxpayer. In order to aid in the process, the Gary Plan was introduced. It had a new organizational scheme in which different subjects would be taught by different departments. Similar to the breaking down of factory jobs under Taylorism, students would be herded from classroom to classroom in order to digest a stream of standardized factual information. Like Pavlov's dogs, they would do so at the ring of a bell. Children go where The first lesson I saw was the terrible confusion that's in any school as people race about at bell-marked intervals. The time-honored experience of mental development is that it occurs with strong concentration, not with fragmented attention, class position, you will not find the doctor's son, however ignorant he is, in uh, the class with the marginalized kids. Indifference is wonderful. This is a factory to create indifference to intellectual things, to ideas. They have to be whipped ordered and disciplined to do anything or just as bad they have to be offered bribes to do it emotional dependency sure probably half of the 60 million kids who attend school in the united states removed from their own families at a very vulnerable age become emotionally dependent on a pat on the head, a smile, avoiding an insult. Intellectual dependency. In spite of rhetoric to the contrary, a teacher's nightmare is invested in those kids, if any, who actually have learned how to think for themselves. The teacher's job is not only to convey 
bits of information that should not be challenged, but also to convey how you connect those bits of information, but not practice in doing that for yourself, you memorize someone else's connection. What is a circle? Billy Hendler. A circle is a closed curve in which all endpoints on the circumference are equally distanced from the center points. Very good. Provisional self-esteem, this, this really ties into the grades, the test scores, the signs of approval by the teacher. You're allowed to feel good about yourself if an authority issues a signal that you can do that. On the other hand, if the authority condemns you, the only way you can feel good about yourself is to become an outlaw. What are we trying to do? If our goal is to help kids become critical thinkers, lifelong learners who really enjoy thinking and reading and playing with numbers and ideas, if we want to help them become good learners and good people who can create and sustain a functioning democracy, then education would look very different from the way it looks right now, at least in our culture. We would have to question the use of grades. What research finds is that when kids are trying to get good grades in school, three things tend to happen. They begin to lose interest in the learning itself. Now the purpose is just to get a good grade uh, rather than to engage with the question or problem at hand. Second, they tend to think less deeply and retain uh, knowledge for a shorter period of time compared to kids who don't have any grades. And third, they tend to pick the easiest possible tasks. That's not because they're being lazy, it's because they're being rational. If we tell kids we want to see a better report card, we want to see higher grades, naturally they'll pick the shortest book or the easiest project because that maximizes the chance of achieving that goal. So uh, regardless of what your, your goal is, if, there's, if you're interested in assessing kids and teachers and schools to see are we doing a good job here, you would never need tests in order to see whether kids are learning and where they need help, and you would never need grades to report the results of the evaluation we place on those assessments. We would certainly do away with standardized testing, the kind of testing used in particular states or provinces uh, where everyone takes the same test and then you compare everyone's scores. These tests tend to measure what matters least. It tends to be a good marker for family income because what standardized tests mostly measure is the size of the houses near a school. Uh, but it's the case that some of our deepest thinking kids just don't do well on tests. And some kids who get great scores have never had an original idea in their lives. Well, I thought you just judge by tests. Oh, no. There are many other things besides tests that we use. Of course, we do consider a child's general ability and the way he scores on standardized tests. But that's not all. Competition builds character. Uh, in fact, what we find is that by any reasonable notion of character in terms of psychological health or self-esteem, that competition undermines that and creates a kind of neurosis because we come to think of ourselves as good and competent only to the extent that we have uh, defeated other people. And so we're always playing this uh, desperate king of the mountain game where we're all worried about triumphing over other people and stepping on their faces and looking at them as if they're going to step on our faces. Now that has two effects. One is it's horrible for us in terms of psychological development because there's a perpetual sense of disease and anxiety. But second, it very logically has a destructive effect on our relationships. We compete because we're raised that way, not because we're born that way. I mean, take, for example, the belief in 
survival of the fittest, which is seen as a Darwinian notion. In fact, Charles Darwin never even used the phrase uh, survival of the fittest. That was coined by a um, right-wing social thinker in the 19th century named Herbert Spencer, who tried to corrupt Darwin's thinking to his own reactionary political purposes. What Darwin talked about was natural selection, which means that the individual organism that's best able to adapt to a changing environment is more likely to be around to survive and reproduce. But that doesn't specify competition as a mechanism. In fact, often the active avoidance of competition, if not the deliberate uh, pursuit of cooperative strategies, turns out to make it more likely that organisms and entire species will survive. The research consistently shows that competition not only isn't necessary for excellence, but tends to impede excellence on most tasks. And the more challenging the task, the more ingenuity, problem-solving skill it requires, uh, the more competition tends to disrupt uh, that achievement. Excellence pulls in one direction, and competition pulls in another. And in fact, another kind of research study corroborates that. If you take a whole bunch of people and give them a task to do, some kind of problem to work out, and half of them are told, see if you can figure out how to do this task. And the other half are told, this is a contest with a prize to whoever wins, whoever does the best job. Study after study after study across cultures, across gender, across ages, uh, find that uh, the people who compete, who have to compete, end up doing an inferior job on that task. At the moment, it appears uh, as though much of what happens in schools in North America is really for the convenience of people who have most of the power. There is, if anything, an act of discouragement of critical questioning. Corporations claim they want kids who are able to think outside the box, but only so far as they're caught within a larger box that works to the advantage of the free market, um, which means that the market economy, based on competition, based on economic rather than human considerations, uh, ends up controlling the system. Today, many people assume that antisocial and even violent behavior by young people is a completely natural phenomenon. Yet anthropological studies reveal this to be a myth. Our widespread use of the term juvenile delinquency exposes not only the failure of modern schooling, but of an important concept given expression by the behaviorists. They called it the frustration-aggression hypothesis. The frustration-aggression hypothesis was an attempt by behaviorists at Yale to combine their own science of behavior with that of the Freudians. Simply put, when people perceive that they are being prevented from achieving just rewards, their frustration is likely to turn to aggression. This study by the behaviorist Hobart Maurer showed that when rats could not achieve their expected reward, they began to take out their frustrations on each other. The scientist notes that two animals which have lost their hold on the pellet, frustration, will be seen to turn on each other, displaced aggression. Similarly, in a 1941 experiment, toys were placed behind a wire screen where children could see but not touch them. When they eventually gained access to the toys, their play became considerably more destructive. On the one hand, human beings are not rats. Armed with the necessary information, we can come to a logical conclusion about who is to blame for our frustrations in life. Rightly or wrongly, we often point the finger squarely back at ourselves. Yet in the hands of politicians and demagogues, frustration aggression can be a potent tool in deflecting anger onto scapegoats.